Our live recordings are trusted only to solid state drives by Kingston Technology. Revive your computer with improved performance and reliability over traditional hard drives with Kingston SSDs. Category 5 TV streams live with Telestream Wirecast and Nimble Streamer. Tune in every week on Roku, Kodi, and other HLS video players. For local showtimes, visit Category5.tv. Welcome to the show, everybody. This is episode number 634, and uh, Category 5 is on the air. This week, we've got a great show planned for you. I, I say that every time, but it's true. We are going to be looking at the brand new Echo device from uh, Amazon. So Ooh. you want to stick around for that. Um, and uh, in the meantime, you too. Nice to see you. It's great to have you here. Uh, Jeff and Sasha are over there. Hi. Hello. I'm Robbie Ferguson, and nice to have you joining us this week. Before we get into the show, I want to remind you, make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube, and make sure you click that bell. That's going to ensure that you get our notifications every time that we are live or when we post brand new videos as well. Jeff, you remember back in the day when we were just wee lads. I do. And yes. there was a particular game. I'm just going to reach over here because I actually have it. Jeff, does this bring back any memories for you? Oh my gosh, oh, yes. Yes. Can you believe it has been 20 years? 20 years. That sounds about right. Since yep. Unreal Tournament, which we now call GOTY or Game of the Year Edition, was released. And this is the, the actual disc. So um, you can still get these wow. on Amazon. You'll get them used, but it's only a couple bucks. You can also um, get the game on Steam for 11 bucks, and you can play Unreal Tournament. Now, this game, I mean, for a lot of us, holds a lot of nostalgia. Oh, yeah. But 20 years, and it's still absolutely playable. It's still a lot of fun. This was the original, I would say, Jeff, this was the original Deathmatch. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it was out around the same time as, um, like, un, um, like Commander Keen. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, as far as a first person shooter, uh, it was that. You had Team Fortress, Counter Strike. They were all kind of within the same time frame of years. Mm. But UT uh, was kind of like that benchmark that everybody used. And I mean, even, even now, like, when I look back on it, like, I think I had the most fun with UT compared to Counter-Strike or Team Fortress. Oh, yeah. And that was about the time that Jeff and I got to know one another. Yes. So, And this is part of how we got to know one another. So this is actually kind of special to Category 5, I think, Jeff. Yeah. Because this game, this game brought us closer together. What was the other one and we here played? We are. Was it uh, We Nexus? played Tremulous. Tremulous, that's Tremulous what it was is a Linux oh. game where we were like spiders and... Yes aliens and running around and everything that was an open source but but tremulous as well as unreal tournament what was neat about this is it was one of the first real games that was available on linux yeah so you can install this directly on linux now it's a it's called a pc cd rom but right on the back you can see tux see that oh, yeah that's right so yes the installer is for windows uh, but it also has an installer for linux so this was i think one of the first games so so it made us um able to play deathmatch mm -hmm. multiplayer across we did land parties yep. what, was, what was our biggest land party would you say oh gosh i want to say we had four or five computers at one point easy eh yeah do you remember the time when we had a land party and we had like people sitting i had like the big uh, 40 inch um, CRT TV and it was connected to a computer. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. Day. yeah, we, yeah this yeah. was like a big LAN party where we had, yes. I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 people over uh, and, and we just had a, an Unreal Tournament LAN party. Yes. Oh, that was so much fun. Those were the days. I love that. I think we need to like have another UT LAN party. I think so. 20 years in, do you think it's still worth playing? Absolutely. What do you think, folks? Um, uh, the Redeemer was my weapon of choice. Weapon oh, of choice, do you remember? I, I, you know what? I think the Redeemer was my go-to as well. Yeah. Mainly because I just couldn't catch up with you. Like, for whatever reason, you were really good at fragging me. Yeah. And with the Redeemer, and I needed to use a Redeemer to at least kind of have some sort of a semblance of fighting back. <laughs> it was so good. So great. I miss that game. Unreal Tournament. You can find it on Amazon still. Again, it's on Steam. Um, it is not for kids. Um, I mean, we say that. It's, it's got a lot of violence, but, um, but it's 
kind of comic mischievous violence and a lot of fun and uh in fact my kids are old enough that we're starting to play this together now Jeff, yeah which is really really cool 20 years in folks unreal tournament so you know big kudos to the developers of that game are you ready for this jeff i want to go through the system requirements folks at home are you ready for this seriously big requirements yeah like. okay <laughs> So I want to install this on my i9-9900K at 5 gigahertz with 64 gigs of RAM. But let's make sure we meet the minimum system requirements according to the Jewel case. Here we go. System requirements. <clears throat> CPU. Pentium 200 megahertz. <laughs> or better. Recommended. Pentium 2, 233. Wow. Memory. 32 megabytes of ram wow recommended 64 megabytes we're not talking gigabytes here okay we're talking megabytes 64 <laughs> mega ram oh my wow. goodness remember when we thought that was big yes uh okay available hard drive space required to install unreal tournament can, back can in the day yeah take, uh, a, take guess? a guess for me uh i'm gonna guess uh, 62 megabytes. You're, you're about half, halfway there. See, I was going to say the, 120. The, yeah, that's the minimum. Uh. The minimum requirement is 120 megabytes. Wow. Megabytes. Um, recommended because it's got, remember, there are two discs here. One of them is the game disc. One of them is the extras. If you want the extras, you're going to need about 605 megabytes <laughs> they're that specific it actually says 605 megabytes is recommended uh okay it's cd-rom windows 9x compatible i want to read this verbatim it says windows 9x compatible so that means this was compatible with windows 95 and windows 98 yet you can still run it on windows 10 and linux now here in 2019 uh, and this of course came out in you guessed it 1999 the video pci local bus video card 3d accelerator recommended <laughs> do you think that my nvidia rtx 6000 is going to be sufficient to play unreal tournament it, it only might has lag just a little bit. I don't know, Jeff. It has maybe it, a little bit. It only has 24 gigs of DDR6 RAM on board. Uh, operating system Windows 95, Windows 98, Windows 2000, because we all played Unreal Tournament on our Windows servers, didn't we? Uh, Windows NT. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, a downloadable Linux version is available at unrealtournament.com. It actually says that right on the jewel case here. Um, network and internet play via TCP IP. <laughs> like there, because there, oh, you can't do this with FidoNet, folks. No, you need a TCP IP <laughs> network. That is just, well, can I say Unreal? <laughs> That's, that's your Unreal Tournament, folks. Happy 20th birthday to the greatest game, probably. I'd say of all time, that's the ultimate deathmatch game. I right should there. try playing it just once. Oh, I, Sasha, I think, I think you, you should. should join us for a LAN party. Because yep. that was before, before we got to know one another. Wouldn't it be just a joy, folks, to have um, Sasha and Jeff together and maybe get the community together to do an Unreal Tournament I land party. I imagine that I would be absolutely annihilated right off the hop. I think so. I'm a pretty good button mm -hmm. masher, mm -hmm. so. Now, because it was so long ago, yeah. would there be capabilities today of online, like, server play? Yes, sir. It's So it's not direct connect to a specific server. It's just open. You could join. You, you create a server in your game. Yep. And it gives everyone else access to that server if it's a public server. If it's a private server, it's LAN only. Or if somebody has your IP and you've got the ports open on your network, then who they'll be able to play as well. Who wants to turn it into a VR game? Well, <laughs> <laughs> they do have modern versions, Sasha. I mean, Unreal Tournament is certainly not dead. Right. Um, but this is the original, the, the, the real deal right here. It's too bad that we couldn't have a bunch of copies available for our patrons that 
where we could do like a patron only <laughs> night, like 20 year edition. Oh, that would be great. Well, I will say if we had, let's just say community, if you were fans of Unreal Tournament, if you don't already have it, grab a copy and Steam. Uh, again, it's only 11 bucks. I got this for six bucks on Amazon used. So you can still get it. Um, get it and get it installed and up and working and then communicate back to us here at Category 5 TV. And let's do it. Let's let's do a LAN party, guys. <laughs> I, I would okay. totally be up for that. Yeah. yeah. All right. I'm yep. in. All right. I'm there. Let's do it. What was the it. other one we played? Uh, oh, All right. The first, like, MMO, Entropia Universe. Wow. Well, that was, a, that was quite a bit later, Jeff. It was, yeah. but, I mean, I do remember playing that one. That was, like, right at the beginning of MMOs. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It yep. still exists as well. It's yes, still it does. it's still out there. I still have my ped. So do I. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know if it really helps me out these days. I've never cashed out, but hey, I've got some good in-game that's right. uh, stuff. But hey, that's so cool. 20 years. I can't believe it. That's wild. Makes me feel a little bit old. But at the same time, wow. That's nostalgia right there. It is. Well, we've got to take a really quick break. When we come back, we're going to be looking at a new product from Amazon. It's called the Amazon Echo Flex. You're going to want to see this. Stick around. Welcome back. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Now, have you got one of these guys yet? I have one. Yeah? Yeah. I'm going to tell you as we start off this demonstration, if your keywords are anything other than Alexa, make sure you turn off your device or mute the microphone for the moment uh, because uh, we're going to be talking about this and demonstrating one of their new devices. So this is the Amazon Echo Dot. The, the the one that doesn't have the built-in clock is the one that I have. And this thing sounds great. It works great. And it's fantastic. But you've got a wire that comes out of the back for power. And it's going to take up, like, desk space or a counter space or something like that. Jeff, where is yours residing right now? Uh, ours is in the kitchen sitting on the windowsill, actually. Okay. There's a plug right beside the windowsill. So That's ideal. We have maybe, you know, half a foot of cord. Yeah. And so it runs behind the silverware, and then it sits right on the windowsill, and it's perfect. It's out of okay. the way. And it's, uh, it's got nice acoustics bouncing off the window. We use it for music in the kitchen all the nice. time. Nice. That does sound really, really good. Um, but what if your plug isn't right next to where the Echo is going to be sitting? Or what if you just want to be able to plug it directly into the plug? Wouldn't Oof. that be nice? Wouldn't Whoa. that be nice? Yes. So... Enter the Amazon Echo Flex. No. This is the brand new one no. from Amazon, and really? it is literally a, a socket um, adapter thingy. It's, a, it's an Amazon Echo that you plug in. It's got the buttons on the face, huh. just, like you, uh, just like you expect to be able to mute the microphone or activate uh, without using the voice command in order to uh, command it. And what if they did something a little bit more? I mean, the connectivity on this, the physical connectivity, I should say. I mean, the wireless and the smart home connectivity is excellent, but the physical connectivity is a little bit lacking. Well, this one, the Amazon Echo Flex. Oh, it's got a USB port. It has a USB port. That's and, nice. And then what if, all hypothetical, right? No, it's not hypothetical at all. What if they brought out accessories, such as a motion sensor? Ooh. That no could just way. plug in like that, <gasps> or say a a LED nightlight. Ooh, that you also could just nice. plug in like that. And these are smart home connected, so you're able to control them. Um, let's actually, I want to plug this in and see what happens. So I've just got this now. Obviously, this is just like you see it here on your screen. You're going to plug this directly into the wall, presumably. Um, I'll just say the nice thing about this is the the convenience, the portability, and the ability to plug it in anywhere. 
Right. Um, you're not going to get the same sound quality. I mean, we come to expect really good sound quality out of these guys. This one is really about the convenience and extending the smart home. So we've already got our smart home kind of built up. We've got some smart devices. We're able to control some lamps and things like that. So this now puts more microphones, some motion sensors and things like that around the house on the cheap. So I, I'm going to plug this in um, just like I would into the wall, and uh, let's see how difficult this is to uh, to actually activate. So on my smartphone here, I'm going to add a device, and I'm going to go Amazon Echo, and let's scroll the list. Look at all the devices that they've got already. It's a growing line. Um, and there's the Echo Flex. Is it plugged in and orange? Yep. Select your Amazon Echo. There's only one. It already picked it up. Select your Wi-Fi network. All right, it's the first one. Perfect. Could it be that easy? I haven't even had to configure anything. Huh. So, but this will be connected to your specific device. Your Echo it's, is ready. Look at that. Wow. Oh. Yeah, it just showed right up in my app. Okay. Sweet. So now, okay, scroll through. It's connected to my Wi-Fi. I didn't have to configure that. Ooh. I've got all these, uh, all the options that you would expect from any Amazon Echo device. Now, I just saw it said a pair uh, a gadget. Sure. Is that, is that the devices that go at the bottom? Uh, well, let's, let's try, Jeff. Um, I'm going to plug this guy in. Oh, first of all here, changing the wake word to... Cancel. <laughs> that was instant. <laughs> and then I want to plug this in. No, those are those are devices like if you have subwoofers or other peripherals. Oh, okay. But this guy, as soon as I plug it in, it's going to flash. Oh, there we go. It looks like it's connecting. I found first motion and sensor. It just stopped. Oh, to set up a routine triggered a by bit? first motion sensor, go there to the is. device detail page in the Alexa app. Nice. Okay. So now, Jeff, I'm going to add a routine. Okay. And I'm going to create new. And I'm going to add an action. And this really reminds me of like, if this, then that, right? Right. So exactly. I'm going to jump into my smart home because that's where this device is going to show up. And you can see there's my motion sensor. And if we detect motion, I want to do what? Let's add an action. So when... The sensor detects motion. I it says, and I cancel, <laughs> and I can select something. Welcome me. Okay, <laughs> cancel. <laughs> but let's let's go into my smart home and and look at my devices. There's my Christmas tree at the top, for example. Okay, okay. so let's just say turn it on. So as soon as it detects motion, it's going to turn on my Christmas tree. <gasps> now, is this the Christmas oh. tree you have at home? Yeah. Yes, exactly. So as you're moving that around, your Christmas tree is going nuts right now. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> no, if it's already on, it's, it's, it's going to be on. But okay. now I can put this uh, in the hallway leading up to the room where the Christmas tree is. Right. And as soon as somebody walks by, if the Christmas tree is off, it will now turn on because okay. it's plugged into my smart power bar. Um, so now, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna disconnect this guy and plug in this, and let's just see what happens the first time that we plug this in. That's the nightlight you said, yeah. right? Oh, look at Ooh. that. Ooh. I found first light, and you can control it by saying, turn off first light. I love, what I love about this is how intuitive it is. Right. Anyone can figure this out. There's no instruction manual that I have to read. I'm just, so it just told me, so I'm going to try this. I'll turn on first light. Okay. Set first light to purple. Okay. I'll set first light to red. Okay. Now, on camera, you're not really seeing how red that really is. No, but we're seeing here, it reflect oh. here in the hands. studio. Are you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, in the, it's it's interesting how LED reacts to our sixty hertz cameras. Right. Uh, change first light to orange. Okay. Yep. And there is a shift in the color. Yep. 
Okay. Uh, change first light to purple. Okay. Oh. There you go. Okay, you can see it on my hand, nice and clear. Now, apparently, that's the secret. Now, Marshman is saying in the chat room, yeah. you know, give her a uh, instruction to change the color to whatever, but don't say okay. Is that an instruction you can give with this device? Because every time it's like, okay, okay, okay. Is there a problem with that? <laughs> no, but I, like, I'm thinking, for instance, Cancel. you know, if you've got a kid who, say, has a Cancel. night light in their room, yeah, yeah. Um, they might just say, turn the light on. Yeah. And you don't want to have this voice coming back to you in the middle of the night going, okay, sure, I'll make that happen. Is this bright enough for you? Like, is, is sure that something you can you can turn I'm sure you can set her off? to whisper or something. You probably can. Just because Jeff wants to know, volume zero. Turn off the first light. Uh, volume eight. Turn on first light. Okay. All right. Volume zero. Turn off first light. Turn on first light. Okay. Oh, she said it. All right. Does it matter? No, well, no, huh. but I just, it was an interesting comment in the, in the chat room, and I was like, you know what? Okay, that's a good question, especially if you've got, say, kids sleeping at night because it is a nightlight. You could set it to be almost like a little bit of a gentle wake up, too. Sure, you could. Right? Yeah, and so you can, set, you can, set, you can it set it to automatically come on at certain times. Oh, set it to oh. turn off my first light. Okay. Can you set first light to come on at 7 a.m.? I don't know how to set first motion sensor to that setting. Oh, she thinks it's a first motion center, sensor. Um, so there are, you know, there's probably going to be help for that kind of stuff. Right. Yes. Whether, like, you can set up routines, though. So I'm in my app, I can set up the routine to do certain things. As I mentioned, it, it really has a reminiscent look to if this, then that. So yes. if a certain time is approached, automatically do whatever. Right. I would like it to change Whether colors, yeah. to be honest, at a certain just, time. Just like change. when it's within the, the, the next, like I have to wake up in the next hour, oh, yeah. change color to a yeah. different color so that when I kind of open my eyes it's and I not, see the wall. It's, it's a nightlight. Like, it, this, this one is a nightlight, exactly. right? So this is the one that's going to go in the hall. Right. For what you want to do, I would get a smart uh, power bar for example, and have it plugged into a lamp and have it, uh, have it turn on or get one that can fade up, for example. Or you can actually get smart lamps that will bring the, the light up like sunlight. Like a, right. like a, oh, yeah. So you get these various devices. So this particular one, again, it's, it's really, it's really super. cheap and it's something that you can just plug in anywhere in the house and it extends that, um, that smart home so that no matter where you are, it will play music. It, uh, it can be uh, a controller for your voice activated, um, things throughout the house. And, uh, and it's all done. It's the exact same. So the questions are like, can it do this? Can it do that? It's exactly the same as this guy, as far as the commands go. Right. So it could broadcast mm -hmm. to the whole family, to all devices. Like if dinner was yeah. ready, right? Like you could just talk to it. It and can. It talk, and, I, it would, and I don't want to demonstrate that. I do have some Echo devices at home, uh, but you can... Um, well, how could I do that? Drop in? Do you want to drop in on kitchen? Right. No. So I have an Alexa device okay. in my kitchen. Drop That's in. why it asked. Oh, right. okay. Um, and I'm holding it like a walkie-talkie. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to hold it like that. You're going to have it plugged in somewhere else in the house. And is it sensitive enough? I mean, oh. drop in. You can drop in right now because you're already in a conversation Oh, cancel. Please ask me to hang up first before. Hang up. I didn't realize I was in a conversation. Oh, so home is listening. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the new Echo Flex. I mean, this is a really, really, I mean, I hate to use the term, but it's a smart device. Um, if it wasn't for such a dumb user, um, <laughs> but you just literally just plug that in anywhere in your house or your office. Um, and we can have these anywhere. So as long as they have Wi-Fi connectivity, you can have devices at home. You can have devices at work. If you like, presumably, like in my situation, I'm in a small office, so I could have that 
at work. I could have one here at the studio and I can use it to communicate with home. I can use it to listen to music uh, in various places. I can use the one at the studio to um, set up alerts that will notify me at home, for example. So it's just an extension of your smart home. And that's the uh, Echo Flex from Amazon. You can get one at cat5.tv slash echo. Now, given that it is something that you would be buying from Amazon. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, for today's episode, and I mean, it is, uh, what are we? We are on uh, November 27th. That's right. We're about to come so up. So if you're watching live. Yeah, if you're watching live. <laughs> but if you're watching this recorded, this is done at November 27th. And so uh, Black Friday starts as of midnight. Right. So in mm. just a few short hours for Amazon, their Black Friday deal starts. So, I mean, if you're going to, if you're, Sitting there going, yeah, you know what? I think I'm going to pick up a couple of these for the house. Mm -hmm. Don't forget our partner links because that's a way to kick back to us with a little bit of uh, cash in the jar and help pay for all the stuff that we do here. And so if you're going to be buying your various devices or anything else from Amazon, maybe you're getting some early Christmas shopping and don't forget to check that out. That's a good idea. Not really if, like when. Yeah. (laughs) When. Exactly. (laughs) You might as well take advantage of the sales. It's uh, category5.tv slash partners will get you there. Um, Sasha, it's time to head over to the newsroom. Are you all set? Sure am. Here's what's coming up in the Category5.tv newsroom. The Department of National Defense is joining the fight against 5G, citing risks to GPS and military operations. Google is serious about ensuring the Pixel line of Android phones is secure. They've announced that they'll pay security researchers up to $1.5 million to find hacks and exploits. The official site for the Monero digital coin was hacked to deliver currency stealing malware to users who were downloading wallet software. And wouldn't it be nice if there was a Facebook rival? Well, there is. And it's founded by the guy who built Wikipedia. Stick around. The full details are coming up later in the show. This is the Category5.tv Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. I'm Sasha Rickman, joined this week by Jeff Weston. Here are some quick honorable mentions this week. Tesla CEO Elon Musk suggested late Tuesday that his company had now received 250,000 pre-orders for the Cybertruck, its Blade Runner-inspired electric pickup. Tesla's unveil event for its first pickup truck was marred by the vehicle's window breaking when an executive threw a meatball at them in an effort to demonstrate... Meatball? (laughs) That's what it... Does, did it not say meatball? No, it's definitely, <laughs> definitely a steel ball. Okay. <laughs> it, would, it would really be news if there was a meatball. <laughs> that, that's like a complete Ron Burgundy. <laughs> I don't know why. It looked like meatball. <laughs> All right. Well, anyways, so ladies and gentlemen, there was apparently a meatball that went through the window <laughs> of this truck, the cyber truck. I don't want uh, to up. You no, know, just keep going. Just keep going. I need it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> So look at meatball. after the meatball, Jeff, after the meatball, <laughs> it turns out the same test was performed before the event and went perfectly. The car's trapezoid shape was also mocked in various memes. Even uh, the official social media pages for Lego had their go at the Cybertruck, but included innovative modular roof racks. Mr. Musk has said on Twitter that the reason Cybertruck is so planar is that it can't stamp ultra hard. 30 times steel because it breaks the stamping press. Despite the initial social media storm on people mocking the truck's design, others had praised the Cybertruck for bringing something new to the table. Wisecam owners will soon find an update removes the AI-driven person detection from their device due to the unexpected termination of the agreement Waze had with their AI provider in Waze's commitment. Wise, sir. Wise. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Meatball ways. <laughs> okay, for the feature for free. They're stating that their own AI division to bring back person direction and other AI improvements to the motion detection wise is being praised by its users on social media for their transparency, though what is not uh, though what is no doubt a difficult situation for their staff. The new firmware, which removes the AI features, is planned for mid-January 2020. There's no ETA yet as to when their new in-house solution will be ready. Let's get into the top stories we're following this week. 
The Department of Defense is joining the fight against 5G, citing risks to GPS and military operations. The issue is with a proposal before the Federal Communications Commission to open the 1 to 2 gigahertz frequency range, the L band, for use in 5G cellular networks. The problem is that some of those frequencies are already in use by the global positioning system and other military systems. In a letter to FCC, Chairman Ajit Pai, Secretary of Defense Mark Esper, pressed for the rejection of the proposal, saying, quote, There are too many unknowns and the risks are far too great to federal operations to allow the proposed system to proceed. This could have a significant negative impact on military operations, both in peacetime and war, end quote. While supporters of the proposal cite the low power of the transmitters and say this should not cause interference, studies performed in 2011 show that GPS signals arriving from space could be overpowered by even low-powered ground-based transmissions thanks to the inverse square law. A report from the National space-based positioning, navigation, and timing systems engineering forum noted that the tests demonstrated that there are significantly detrimental impacts to all GPS applications assessed, end quote. Could it be that we're like approaching that time when there just aren't enough frequencies left? Like, do you think that we're almost there? Uh, well, I, yeah, yeah, it sounds like we're there. They're using frequencies that are already in use. Can, well, are there more frequencies we can just tap into? Let's well, jump into the 50 gigahertz band and see what it does to our brains. Like, that's the thing, right? Mm -hmm. It's got to well, be I mean, safe. If, uh, we've had Wi-Fi interviews covering in the past how they want to split up the way that they're doing Wi-Fi in the home. So it makes me right. wonder if there's a way to take some of these bands and kind of do the same deal. Uh, you know, because it was... I forget what the technology was yeah. called, but it was an innovative new approach that basically was kind of like, you know, adding more lanes to a highway when it comes to Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if something like that could add more bands without necessarily boosting to a higher power. Um, but you still need, in order to have more bands, if you will, uh, using your term, it's, it, you need more frequencies, right? So, but if they put things on, I, I think what the issue here is, the misconception that terrestrial low powered broadcast will not interfere with the big powerful satellites that have really powerful broadcasts. But it will, thanks to the inverse square. Exactly. Do you, <laughs> it's just like, what's that? Well, do you remember <laughs> anybody who has ever done karaoke knows that if you take the left and right channel and invert one of them and overlap them, you get a mono signal and it takes the vocals out. Well, how does that happen? It happens because typically vocals are in the middle. So uh, it, by in, inverting, you're phasing out the middle channel. So uh -huh. similarly, you're going to get an, like that kind of effect where two overlapping signals, you're going to cause interference that is going to actually phase out certain portions of that signal. And I think that's the concern that has been brought forward. But of course, those who are creating the low-powered terrestrial signals are saying, oh, no, these are just low-powered signals. It's not going to cause any problem. But meanwhile, yeah, there's a very real chance that it could. So I wonder what the solution would be. I would think that the military should probably have a frequency that couldn't be... Like the L band? <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's yeah. the thing is they've 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 been using their own band, but that. Oh. But the issue I think is that, uh, I mean, I'm I'm speculating because I'm not on the inner circle of the U.S. military. Uh, obviously, I can't even get a meatball right. Uh, but the thing is, the military has always been ahead of the curve when it comes to technology. Yes. And it makes me wonder if we've kind of hit this period in in our world where technology is starting to advance faster than what the military can advance. And so the issue they're running into is that society's catching up. Right. And so is it possible that we're reaching a point, I mean, not even just about a signal, but that in general, the world has started to nip at the heels of military advancement because of so many companies and so many smart people out there doing crazy things on a personal mm -hmm. enterprise that the military is going, can we keep up? Right. And what does this mean yeah, for the Yeah, got to stay ahead of that curve. Yeah. So then they say, okay, no more 5G. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, that's right. Really? You're that's going it, back because to two thirty three computers. Because that's I mean, that's the only thing they can do right now. It really would mess with their safety, right? Their security sure. and well, I mean, so. look at, uh, I'm going to say it was a couple of years ago, we had that whole GPS issue where uh, people were using their Fitbit at secret military bases yes. and it was showing up on a map Yeah, yes. because they're walking around. Like technology has reached the point where we're going, ooh, what kind of other implications are we not paying attention to that just seems so benign, but really is a big concern. Mm-hmm. And, and this is one where the military may actually have a very legit concern going, this could be a national security risk if we have, you know, special signals that get intercepted by Joe Blow with his, you know, low frequency stuff at home. It's, it's very true. I don't know. I don't even, I don't know how to properly answer the concern, to be honest. I, I don't either. <laughs> but it's an interesting story to follow for sure. Mm-hmm. Google is serious about ensuring the Pixel line of Android phones is secure. They've announced that they'll pay security researchers up to $1.5 million to find hacks and exploits. The company said Thursday that effective immediately, they'll pay $1 million for a, quote, full chain remote code execution exploit with persistence, which compromises the Titan M secure element on Pixel devices, end quote. They'll also pay $500,000 for exploits that covertly steal data from a Pixel or bypass its lock screen. Google will offer a 50% bonus to any of its rewards if the exploit works on specific developer preview versions of Android. That means a critical Titan M hack on a developer preview could fetch $1.5 million and a data exfiltration or lock screen bypass could earn $750,000 and so on. Previously, rewards for the most severe Android exploits topped out at $200,000. The big reward bump coincides with the investments Google has poured into securing the Pixel. The Titan M is a Google-designed chip that's physically segregated from the main chipset of the device. Titan M was first introduced in 2018 with the rollout of the Pixel 3. It's also in the recently released Pixel 3a and will also be included in the just-released Pixel 4. Security researcher Salim Rashid suspects we're in the midst of an iOS Android security paradigm shift. To understand the significance of Google's announcement, third-party exploit brokers ZeroDM will pay hackers $100,000 to weaponize a lock screen bypass on either iOS or Android. Google are offering up to seven and a half times as much. Wow. So... That's that's really just smart thinking, really, because it's worth the money to pay to make sure that there isn't going to be an exploit by somebody malicious. You, Correct. right? You just really want to be, I guess, you want to be enticing enough that nobody's going to pay m- more for the exploit right. than what you were. So they're like, oh. yeah, and you may as well use it for good, right? Right. So sure. So if... if- if someone's going to hack the operating system of an Android device, a Pixel device, mm-hmm. may as well give them enough incentive that instead of selling that to the bad guys, yeah. we'll sell it directly to Google so that they can fix it. And you're going to get seven and a half times. Right. I would do it for good and also for $750,000. Now, I mean, this sounds self-serving i mean not for myself because i have no clue how to even go down that road i am not a hacker cracker at all but this seems like a a potential self-serving problem for somebody who goes i found the exploit yeah i found the problem google i realize you're offering 1.5 million but i can sell it on the black market for 4 million but they can't they They cannot i think that's the thing they can sell it for a hundred thousand so google's saying we'll give you seven and a half times that exactly google is totally outbidding the highest bidder of any i i I understand that but i mean as we keep bumping these prices up people are going to recognize oh if i find that one exploit it's going to be a massive payday and i'm not happy with 1.5 like right now we're seeing 1.5 how long before we're going to see a three or a ten or a $25 million payout for an exploit to be identified. Because, I mean, you have to ask yourself, how much money is Google going to make in putting out these phones? And, you know, is somebody going to look at it and be like, nah, it's not good enough. Like, does, does this just, you know, <laughs> breed some selfishness? I don't know. No. 
No, I, f- I feel like it's such a good payout. Like, it's such an amazing reward. Uh, I think that people will actually up their game trying to find it. It turns into, like... Oh, sure. It turns into f- trying to find an Easter egg in, um, oh, some movie that I can't remember right now. There's Easter eggs in a whole bunch of movies. Yes, okay. <laughs> but yeah. but it, it will make people try harder to actually find the exploit, making the exploits obvious faster, making it more secure quicker, and then there won't be the option of selling anything to the the dark web. I think that's the intent. Because it's all yeah. secure I, now. I, I for guess. sure. Right? So nobody's going to be like, ah, can I have $751,000? If there's anything that we know, like from the whole um, marketplace of, let's say, ransomware, just using the example, what do we know about hackers do to ransomware? They want a quick payday. Right. Right. So if I'm a hacker and I'm not, but if I was and I found this exploit and was able to create an exploit for the pixel, I'm going to want what? A quick payday. So am I going to go to the guys that are giving me $100,000 or am I going to go to the ones that are paying me $750,000? You know what the answer to that is. Yes. That is the idea behind what Google is doing, I suspect. And I think that it's a, a really good motivator for, um, for uh, I'll say a motivator. A lot of times what we perceive as a bad guy in the hacking industry, we'll call it, is really just somebody that it has fallen upon the wrong channel, okay? If I find this hack, oh, I can sell it for $100,000. So if that's my option, now I've got this opportunity to get $100,000. Right. And, and it's not necessarily that they are a bad person or that they are doing a bad thing. It's just, well, but now it's been weaponized because the the that group has bought it. So what they're doing is they're also reallocating the the brilliant minds of the youth and the the hacker the hackers and re- redirecting that toward correcting the situation and saying okay we'll give you more money and and you're going you're helping to improve the security of the platform. Right. So I think it's a whole it 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 does so much good. I agree. I think they should also offer them a job, to be honest. And that, that <laughs> could happen. Yes. Microsoft sure. used to do that years ago when they first set up their website. It was it can happen. Multiple yeah. layers For of sure. security. And they're like, if you break in, you get a job here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I feel like this whole story is something that like would inspire Amy D.D. Right. Mm. Like she would just be like, yeah, I'm all over this. <laughs> <laughs> We've got to take a quick break. The Crypto Report and more of this week's top tech stories are coming up. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. Let's take a quick look at the Crypto Report and how things look as of Wednesday, November 27th. 2019 via our website, Category5.tv. We've been collecting the data and looking at how things have been transitioning over the past week, and we're seeing that Bitcoin is really losing a fair bit this week, um, dropping down more than $1,000 U.S. as far as its uh, U.S. dollar equivalent value, um, down at $7,193 and change. Uh, Litecoin is also down. I mean, everything is is on the decline this week. It's at $46.87. Ethereum is at $147.81. Monero is down at $51.54. Not dropping as much as I would have expected considering the exploit that happened on their website this week. Turtlecoin is uh, holding fairly steady, having dropped just 0.01 ten thousandths of a cent to 0.23. And we're now looking at the basic attention token as well, um, and that is is down from last week at zero, uh, well, 21 cents US per coin. Uh, remember that this is not, we're not providing any kind of financial advice or investment advice. What we are giving you is just the facts with regards to cryptocurrency and the different coins that we are monitoring here at the studio. The cryptocurrency market never closes and it's always volatile. So make sure that you only invest what you are able and willing to lose because it's quite probable that you may never turn an an income from it. Um, And that's not our intent. Uh, We just want to give you the facts. You can find out more 
at Category5.tv. Click on Shows, the Category5.tv newsroom, and you'll see the crypto report there. And that will just give you uh, up to uh, up to the day uh, cryptocurrency data for the coins that we are tracking. I'm going to head back over to the newsroom to you, too. Thank you, Ravi. The official site for the Monero digital coin was hacked to deliver currency stealing malware to users Speaking who of. were downloading wallet software. Mm -hmm. Yep. The supply chain attack came to light last week, Monday, when a site user reported that the cryptographic hash for a command line interface wallet downloaded from the site didn't match the hash listed on the page. Over the next several hours, users discovered that the mismatching hash wasn't the result of an error. Instead, it was an attack designed to infect Get Monero users with malware. Site officials later confirmed that finding. An analysis of the malicious Linux binary found that it added a few new functions to the legitimate one. One of the functions was called after a user opened or created a new wallet. It sent the wallet seed, which is the cryptographic secret key used to access wallet funds, to a third-party server. The malware then sent wallet funds to another server. At least one person participating in a Reddit forum claimed to have lost digital coins after installing the malicious Linux binary. A malicious Windows version of the CLI wallet carried out an almost identical attack sequence. Anyone who downloaded the CLI Monero wallet on Monday, November 18th, 2019 is advised to check the hashes of their binaries. If they don't match the official ones, delete the files and download them again. Do not run compromised binaries for any reason. I think this if that goes... Scary. Yeah, and this yeah. just goes to show, like, if there is a checksum um, difference, so if you've got the MD5 or the SHA um, checksum, and it doesn't match what it's supposed to be, just don't even touch it. Just, like, find out what's going on because you may think, hey, well, that, that's weird. It doesn't match. Well, in this particular case, it could have saved, like, uh, the one that I heard of, like, l lost $7,000 out of their wallet as far as U.S. Ow. currency goes. And it just, you know, you got to be careful. And, and cryptocurrency is a really, really lucrative um, target for malicious attackers. And it can happen. It mm -hmm. can happen. And in this case, hey, you have yeah. to be really diligent. I mean, it would be it would be so simple just to assume that everything was going right, except here here you go, and the hashes don't yeah. match up. Yeah, well, right? exactly. And I mean, I know that there's different type of wallets you can use. Like you can use your cloud-based wallet. You can have a uh, software wallet. You can have a paper wallet uh, that's completely cut off from the world. Uh, but I mean. Each of them comes with their own risks. I mean, and if you're going to go with a paper wallet because you're like, hey, I, I don't want to be caught by something like this. If you ever lose your paper, you're toast. Right. Um, you know, and, and it's unfortunate. I mean, as somebody who has mined Monero in the past, you know, it, it's so easy to just kind of like, oh, here's, you know, another wallet. I'm going to try this sure. one. Sure. And you're not even paying attention. And then you hit your miner and away you go. Yeah. And you walk away and then come back days later to see how you're doing. And in that meantime... You've lost everything because you're oh. not paying attention. And it's so easy to do. Jeff, I've even heard of people that will set up automatic updates for their wallet software and their mining software. And when you do that, and it's, it's tough because a lot of times, like Scala is a perfect example where the coin has changed so many times that it just gets frustrating because you've got to keep reinstalling the software. So people will tend to set up a, an automatic updater. And what happens if that update comes down the wire and it's malicious? That's yep. a big problem. And, and when it comes to cryptocurrency, there's there's really no way to get your money back. Once no. it's gone, it's no, gone. It's, it's gone. not like it's a regulated financial transaction yeah. where you know you it's can a, buy insurance on it. Right. It's not insured in yeah. any way. Like, and it's scary that this is happening. So I, f I feel like it's early in the life of cryptocurrency. But I know it's not like early, early days, but I feel like it's scary that now as it's becoming more common knowledge uh, that cryptocurrency exists and people are kind of getting right on the bandwagon in the malls, there are Bitcoin vendors. And now this is coming out, which makes me think, is this the beginning of a cycle that's going to gain momentum? And I wonder whether or uh, not there is going well, to be a way then to ensure that that's a valid concern, Sasha. Yeah. Right? But I, I think what it is is it's really just like 
this is something that's going to constantly be under attack. So is this going to be a wake-up call for Monero's developers, for example, to solidify their security? Something went wrong. Something allowed this to happen. They'll need to f- figure out what happened and put a stop to it and, and protect their users, plain and simple. Yeah. It, it makes me wonder, I mean, because you already have... Uh, the U.S. government looking at regulatory oversight and declaring Libre from Facebook right. as uh, a securities currency. Mm-hmm. It makes me wonder if this is going to open the door because of the issues we've that have gone around the globe with Bitcoin, and now you've got this issue with Monero. If it's going to start pushing regulatory oversight and legislation that says, you know what, cryptocurrencies are in fact a financial transaction. They should be governed by the nah, Securities Commission. I don't fear and, that. No, but it makes you it does make me wonder if it's gonna get to the point where somebody's gonna bring that topic up and say this needs to happen. Nah, they're just gonna say too bad, so sad. It's not a valid currency. That's how they'll move on. Yeah. So and speaking of Sasha, we're gonna yes. jump into the next story. Wouldn't it be nice if there was a Facebook rival? Well, there is. And it's founded by the guy who built Wikipedia. Jimmy Wales is expressing excitement that his new social network, WT Social, already has more than 160,000 members. The platform says it will never sell user data and relies on the generosity of individual donors rather than ads. The donations are by way of a modest subscription fee. It is positioning itself as news-focused place and says members will be able to edit misleading headlines. Hmm. They will see the articles shared by their network in a timeline format, appearing with the newest first rather than algorithms that try to appeal to their interests. The introduction to WT Social says, quote, we will empower you to make your own choices about what content you are served and to directly edit misleading headlines or flag problem posts. We will foster an environment where bad actors are removed because it is right, not because it suddenly affects our bottom line, end quote. In a recent interview with the Financial Times, Mr. Wales shared his view that the problem with advertising-led services such as Facebook is that the winner is often low-quality content. Social media consul- consultant Zoe Carnes said that she thought the network would have to grow its numbers quickly in order to prove itself to be an, a viable alternative to the giants. She says, quote, it's going to need a lot of money plowed into it. People are so used to social media being free. Hmm. I think businesses might pay for it, but people are so used to having news at their fingertips for free, end quote. WT Social is a separate entity to Wikipedia and can be found at wt.social. This is an interesting one. I would say that this is some, I'm not necessarily something that I'm going to immediately delve into, but I like the idea of paying for the idea that my stuff is never going to be sold. Like if I And could, you're not going to be from the sound of it, you're not going to be manipulated right. by what is making them money. Exactly. Now, the, the, the tricky part about it is a little bit like in the back of my mind, I think Wikipedia isn't like a super reliable source when you're doing research, but this isn't about research. This is about entertaining news stories. Social media. So, social yeah. media. Yeah. See, I wonder though, like I get what they're going for and, mm-hmm. I, and I get the whole subscription-based thing, whatever that modest fee might be. I don't know if it's something I would, I would pay, pay for. I would pay $7 a month. I, <laughs> see, that I don't is what think I would pay. But would you pay 14 No. All see, right. I don't think I Seven. would because once they get you hooked, then the fees go up because, oh, it's more expensive. We've oh, added new wow. features. Wow. Jeff is, is like all over. Like, as soon as you give them $5, it'll be $10 tonight. Well, I know. But, okay. Okay. So but that's I the think... way that Netflix was. And I mean, and they keep pushing out new content, but which is great. I'm not, I'm not knocking Netflix, but I mean, you get locked in at seven ninety nine. dollars what was it, 10 years <laughs> ago, and now you're looking at fourteen ninety nine. Like, they, the price has doubled. And you're still getting the same services, just extra content. They're producing more shows. But, th- I mean, that's Netflix. The whole point with this thing, my concern, though, is the fact that it's user-edited input. Like, we already have a problem now with fake news and me- manipulating. This is the opposite of fake news, though. No, I understand that. But somebody edits it. I mean, you see this now with Wikipedia. Yes. I mean, what was it? about? Fi- for 15 years, there was a fake religious god that was on Wikipedia that was deemed to be real, but in fact it wasn't because somebody put something on there that wasn't true and it never got caught. So 
what's to say you have a news article where somebody goes, hey, you know what? This is this is a great article, but I think I'm going to change it just just slightly so that it's 98% true, but there's a little bit of false fact in it, and suddenly it continues to grow and it takes off. We already have this problem now. The whole idea of having a social media s- subscription-based service that people can then edit and alter the news on, I find wrong. But the alternative is a social media platform where you don't have the opportunity to edit. Those who have the money control exactly. the editing. So, so right. those we, who have who put billions of dollars into it are able to control so and edit the Exactly. Headlines. So if you're given the choice of only two things, you're given Facebook or WT Social. Facebook is free, uh, right? <laughs> but you're going to be manipulated according to what they think you want to see. I, and a I, WT I, Social is going to show you news stories that could perhaps be edited by peers. So the question becomes then, Jeff, would you give WT Social a chance by trying it for a couple of months just to see if your concerns are valid? Or are you so dead set against this kind of idea? I mean, I love the idea of Wikipedia. Yeah. Uh, I love that uh, social aspect of sharing information. Right. I do With too. And I, and I use Wikipedia yeah. often. Um, I would be willing to give WT Social a try. Not interested in paying for it. Yeah. Like, if they want to get people on board, they need to open up the doors for, say, three or six months, get people sucked in where it's free. They it's- start building a presence there because so many people, I think, are going to turn an eye to this and go, I'm not putting out many money for something where there's only 160,000 people. I have to just say that actually nothing is free. No, it's true. I, I, I understand that. One right? way or another, you're paying for it. So I would rather actually pay money out of my pocket than to try and be afraid of where they're making money on my behalf. Like, where, where are they getting the money from me existing? Like, like there's on no, that platform. But there's no way that you're going to be able to say that the data and how you use their site still isn't going to be used for somebody's personal gain. They said they're not going to sell it. It doesn't mean the fact that they can't have subsidiary companies Mm -hmm. that utilize that same information. (laughs) And I I want to point out that we're we're really, Jeff, uh, we're getting into speculative. I I understand. This is all speculation and and I don't like to go there. I I, I know. Time will tell. And I actually love the idea that somebody, anybody, somebody's got to do something different, is coming up and saying, "Hey, you're not stuck with the one yeah. choice. There is now going to be other choices, and maybe this isn't the only one that's going to exist. This is the first of maybe I, many." I agree. Who knows? It, it, there's <laughs> always going to be changing options. I just there's something about it just kind of. Yeah, feels hinky. <laughs> Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.TV newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash newsroom. From the Category 5.TV newsroom, I'm Sasha Rickman. I'm Robbie Ferguson. And I'm Jeff Weston. We've got to take a really quick break, folks. Stick around. Well, thank you so much for joining us this week, everybody. It's been a blast. Um, it is time for us to add more space to our storage server. And uh, here at the studio, of course, we produce HD and now Ultra HD video every single week. And we've been doing so now. We're in our 13th season of doing so every single week. And that takes up a lot of space. But the question now becomes... Do we add more spinning disks to our storage server, as we've always done? Or is it time to switch to SSDs? And then we say, well, is it really worth going to SSDs? And I'm talking enterprise-level Kingston SSDs. Is it going to be worth it? And so we're actually going to put it to the test. We're going to look at the thermals. We're going to look at the speed. We're going to look at how well they perform in uh, as, as a replacement storage um, device. 
So pulling out the old spinning drives and putting in some new SSDs, let's see how things are going to change. Um, so that's all happening next week. I hope that you'll be able to join us. Thank you so much again for being here with us this week. I'm Robbie Ferguson saying have a great night, and you two over there. Have a good one. Good night. See you, everybody. Thank you.